Hi, thank you for joining us for this special Friday edition of the webcast. As you all know, um, this Sunday is the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And with that, we've got some statistics and some facts that we'd like to share with everyone about the DHAT program and the public that we served. With us today, we have Nicholas Bilka, Nicholas Hickman, and Eva Tafoya. And while we will each cover a few items here and there about Ike, uh, we welcome any questions that you may have about Ike at the end of the program. And we will spend the first couple of minutes going over some statistics on um, DHAP Katrina. For starters, DHAP Katrina had 47,295 referrals from FEMA. Of that, the initial referral, as you all remember, uh, was a large referral of 28,890. After that, there were several referrals that came over the next couple of months. Um, HUD accepted 45,447 of these. Monthly, at the height of DHAP Katrina, we had 30,000 families receiving HUD assistance, and that was as of October 1st, 2008. The breakdown of the families receiving assistance throughout the states throughout that, that received the families were 18,221 were in Louisiana, Texas had 11,481, Mississippi had 2,761, Georgia had 1,031, Tennessee had 740, Arkansas had 663, Colorado 214, Alabama 191, Florida had 160, California 139, Oklahoma 107. These were the top 10 agencies that had the highest concentration of Katrina recipients, Katrina DHAP recipients. Um, this by no means indicates that these were all the, the PHAs that were participating with us. Um, for DHAP at Katrina, we had in excess of 300 PHAs nationwide who were able to assist Katrina evacuees. And for that, we are very thankful. Um, a breakdown of where these PHAs were and how many each PHA received of the top 10 again. We have Harris County with a grand total of 11,023, and that's in Texas. In Louisiana, we had the Housing Authority of New Orleans, 6,966. Also in Louisiana, we had Pilgrim's Rest Community Development Agency with a total of 2,962. We had the Housing Authority in Louisiana of Jefferson Parish with 2,501. In Texas, Houston Housing Authority, 1,763. Louisiana, the Housing Authority of East Baton Rouge, 1,106. Texas, the Housing Authority of the City of Dallas, 833. Tennessee, the Housing Authority of Memphis, Memphis Housing Authority, 416. Texas, San Antonio Housing Authority, 410 and Texas Austin Housing Authority, 353. Again, these are not indicative of all the PHAs who assisted. Uh, we had in excess of 300, uh, but these were the top 10 broken down by percentages. Some information on the population that we saw in DHAP Katrina. For case management, we have a total number of 46,931 total potential cases which were taken in. Of that, Cases that were active at the end of the program were 31,617. Heads of household who were age 62 or older were recorded as being 3,086. 3 Heads of household who reported a self, who self-reported a disability were 6,466. Heads of household who were elderly and disabled, age 62 and over, were reported as being 1,289. Heads of household who were non-elderly but disabled under 65 were reported as 5,177. Hardship waivers in effect at program close are 7,327. Case managers with active caseloads at program close were reported at 1,032. For DHAP Katrina, the ratio of households to case managers at program close was 31 to 1. Closed Cases prior to program end broke down as follows. Case management services never provided or likely unable to contact were 5,027. Cases which were non-compliant with case managers and therefore terminated from the program, 768. Non-compliant with other DHAP rental assistant requirements, 2,217. Moved out and could not be located, 2,742. 
deceased were listed as 239. No longer needing services and voluntarily leaving the program, 2,401. Permanent housing secured breaks down into 1,883. Of that, we have 690 who were able to move to rent subsidized housing, 379 who were able to move into private rental housing, 185 who moved in with other family members or obtained other permanent housing, and 629 who purchased new homes and or currently own their home and were able to move back in. This information that we were able to capture um, on the families for DHAP Katrina was really, really vital in telling the story of the success um, at the time of the first DHAP program ever rolling out. And it's because of the work that you and your staff has, have been able to do and provide us um, with this kind of information that really lets us be able to say that we are able to assist families who are able to actually move on to self-sufficiency or um, move on to permanent housing plans. It's, it's really important to be able to say that while catastrophic and uh, while a large program that required lots of work um, on behalf of everyone. There are cases like this that we can break down where permanent housing was secured. Um, lately, we've been receiving a lot of success stories. We often hear about cases um, that aren't always the positive ones, but we really look forward to hearing success stories. And over the weekend, as you, as you hear lessons learned from Katrina and you see the broadcast and, and you see the articles being run, please you know, take a moment to think about all the work that you did and, and just how thankful we all are um, for the work that you did do. Thank you so much for stepping up and taking part of this unprecedented program to help this unprecedented amount of, of individuals who required assistance. Um, your, your, your assistance, your help, it, in numbers it speaks volumes. Um, later we'll talk about DHAP Ike numbers as they compare, but for Katrina and for this having been the first time this program program ever rolled out, the work that you were all able to accomplish is just astounding. And we all thank you, and I'm sure the public as well you know, shares the sentiment. So um, thank you very much. Um, with that, I will go through a couple of notes and pass it over to Nick afterwards. Um, with DHAP Ike, our audits continue, and as I mentioned, uh, we are receiving success stories because for Every case that we get where an individual questions the type of assistance that they received or if they got the correct assistance, um, we're also happy to be able to say that there are plenty of cases where um, the assistance worked well for them and they were able to move on. And as we come across those and we work with you on your audits, if you have cases like that that you'd like to, to share with us, uh, definitely please do because it's through the information that you're able to ga gather through case management, which Nick will talk about, and through the audits and reviews, which Eva will talk about, that we're able to really tell about the hard work that you've done out there and the families that were served. So with that, Nick. Okay, case management. Uh, a few points to talk about. Special report requests. All special report requests must be uh, made to, by the PHA point of contact and directed to the inf InfoPath Technical Assistance Advisors. Um, their contact information is as follows. For Louisiana, Vanessa Patterson, 239-242-0665, um, vpatterson at informationpathways.com is her email address. Um, for USA and Texas, Natasha Emery, her number is 713-655-0332, um, and her email address is nemery at informationpathways.com. And for Texas, Yvette Camel smith her number is 713-655-0332, um, and it's ycamelsmith at informationpathways.com. Um, for referrals, service referrals must be made by case managers relative to the IDP for each individual. Um, referrals should be specific to each participant and their needs based on the information gathered through the needs assessment in the IDP. Referrals should provide the client with provider service contact information, including a contact name. Participants, when possible, should be encouraged to contact service providers independently. Support should be given to those clients who have limitations on following up on their own service needs. Case managers should follow up with the client and service providers to ensure service provision. It's recommended that case managers follow up every 30 days with clients and service providers. PHAs will be monitored against their service referrals entered into the system. Case managers are required to record referral information in the case management tracking system under Record Referrals for IDP, Crisis, and Secondary Goals. 
Case managers are required to update referrals in the case management tracking system under view and update progress on referrals. Um, it's a reminder to complete quarterly needs assessments. Um, needs assessments on all heads of household must be conducted to determine service needs. Um, after the formation of the baseline needs assessment, uh, reassessments must be updated every quarter for the duration of the program. Quarterly reassessments are based on the date of the executed DRSC for all heads of household. Participants must be, may be reassessed more frequently if deemed necessary. It is recommended that individual needs assessment be established for all family members age 18 years of age or older. HUD minimum reassessment requirements should be completed in the following areas. Updated income information, updated employment information, and updated employment readiness information. Further, HUD recommends one home visit with a participant at least quarterly. InfoPath recently received inquiries about how to download archival files. Users with a system role of site administrator may download DHAP Ike assessment data. DHAP Ike points of contact usually serve as site administrator. How do I download it? Um, the answer is uh, five download links will be created um, by NLT um, September 1, 2010 to allow data downloads. Um, the five different uh, links that you'll have, uh, DHAP data download for assigned families, DHAP data download contact attempts, DHAP data download IDP efforts, DHAP data download referral information, and assessment survey flat file. Download instructions pertaining to the above listed reports will be posted on the ETO website when the links are made active. If you need additional assistance in identifying how to export and download case management data, please contact your Information Pathways representative. Please ensure that your notes and case management tell a story. There should be enough detail and documented efforts so that anyone reading the notes could have a good idea what, what transpired with the contact. When completing the information, uh, income information portion of the needs assessment, make sure the information is as accurate as possible. Many demographic reports HUD runs depend on uh, the information in this and are used for programmatic decisions. As the program near, nears a close, time should be spent on the following up on referrals and making new referrals for families who will continue to have service needs once DHAP Ike ends. As always, case managers should do their best to adhere to the re recommended frequency of contact based on participant tier level. Given the point where we are in the program, the expectation is that agencies that are serving the families with the most needs, meaning those in the highest tier the most often. It's been noted that certification of family obligations are missing from some case management files. This document is required in the files. The document also must be filled out correctly, meaning the family agrees to participate in case management services and the form is signed and dated. InfoPath continues to be available to provide webinar for grantees. Please make a request to your point of contact to schedule a webinar. The department truly appreciates your efforts in providing disaster-related case management assistance to displaced families. Keep up the good work. And now, um, next, we will go to um, Eva Tafoya, who will um, give us some information on file reviews. Okay, uh, we we have been uh, HUD staff and some of our um, contractors have been to several PHAs. Uh, we've been reviewing files to try and determine what challenges remain in terms of documentation and calculations. Uh, as the program comes closer to an end, PHAs will want to look through their files, try to organize them, try to correct any remaining deficiencies. Um, this will help later on down the road. Um, PHAs will want to look out for some common file errors and all um, and DIS errors, and I'll go over those right now. Um, with regard to initial lease-up activities, uh, we found many DRSCs that haven't been signed by the PHA and the landlord within 30 days of each other and within 30 days of the effective date of the DRSC. Um, PHAs should really take care to adhere to these time frames whenever the family moves to a new unit. 
Many of the files that we've reviewed have been missing leasing documents and unit information, um, a DRSC, DRSC addendum, lease, rent reasonableness determination, and uh, inspection report should be in the file for each unit that the family moves to while the family is assisted by DHAP. The file should also contain a DRSC amendment for each unit that the family has leased after March 2010. Uh, family, uh, PHAs really should be pretty diligent in collecting these documents each time a family moves. We have also found several files in which the file information showing the dollar amounts of rent, IRT, and HAP payments does not match the corresponding amounts in DIS. If there's a circumstance that would explain a, div a divergence between the file amounts and the amounts in DIS, um, that really should be documented in the file. It should be pretty clear in the file why that would be the case. Um, in most cases, however, the PHA will need to ensure that the amounts in DIS are supported by the file information. We've seen some files that contain um, information with the effective dates of DRSCs, EOPs, or hardship exemptions that don't match the corresponding dates in DIS. Again, if there's an unusual situation where those dates shouldn't be the same, um, the file should contain clear documentation explaining the divergence, but generally they should be the same. Um, Moving on to issues with continued eligibility, incremental rental transition, and hardship exceptions. Uh, some of the files we've reviewed are missing continued eligibility determinations for some quarters or contain late um, continued eligibility determinations. Um, continued eligibility determinations, of course, are due by the end of each quarter. Um, and if the HA has not received income documentation by that day, the file should show that there's been some attempt to rectify the situation, either we, with an EOP or attempting to the, contact the family, something in the file that shows what the PHA has done um, in that situation. Um, we've seen some files with just insufficient income documentation. Just please ensure that the families are um, returning documentation of income. Uh, and remember that if more than one adult family member has income, that income should be counted in determining um, eligibility and the amount of hardship exceptions. Uh, we've seen some files as well that don't contain um, continued eligibility or um, incremental rental transition calculations. Either that or we've seen files that we just can't identify those, those calculations. They're just not clearly labeled and dated in the files and therefore it appears that those, um, that those determinations haven't occurred when they were supposed to. Um, so it's a good idea to have your continued eligibility um, hardship calculation worksheets, IRT worksheets, uh, labeled and dated, and um, just kind of uh, correspond with the income documentations in the file, maybe be placed with them. Um, with regard to EOPs, there have been files that, um, that we've seen that don't have the appropriate documentation that shows that the families um, that the family who was EOP'd was notified uh, before the EOP occurred um, and informed of the opportunity to appeal. It's really important to keep a copy of that notice in the file. Um, if the fi if the family did appeal, the file should contain documentation that um, a hearing officer issued a written decision before the family was finally terminated. Uh, finally, several of the files that we reviewed don't have um, information explaining the EOP reason that's listed in DIS. 
files should contain some form of documentation to show that the EOP reason listed in DIS is accurate. For instance, if the family violated family obligations by failing to supply required information, then the PHA could document that in the file with any letters or notices that the PHA gave to the family requesting the information, along with the termination notice. Um, I'm just going to give a brief reminder of what is involved in the calculations for continued eligibility, um, uh, the monthly rental subsidy, and the hardship exception. Um, so in order to be eligible for continued DHAP bike assistance, um, the family must demonstrate that the family's current housing costs exceed 30% of the family's current monthly income. For purposes of this requirement, monthly income is the family's annual income divided by 12. Housing costs are defined as the rent for the unit the family is residing in under DHAP Ike, and mortgage payments, if any, on the family's primary pre-disaster residence, including principal interest, real estate taxes, real property insurance, and the cost of utilities. Rent is calculated as the full rent of the family's DHAP Ike unit, not simply the family share of the rent under DHAP Ike, as well as the utility allowances established by the PHA for the PHA Housing Choice Voucher Program. Keep in mind that under DHAP Ike, the gross rent of the DHAP Ike unit, um, rent to owner under the lease, plus the PHA utility allowance for any utilities that are the tenant's responsibility. Um, that that gross rent is used only for the purpose of making this continued eligibility determination. The gross rent and the PHA utility allowances is never used when determining the amount of the DHAP bike monthly rent subsidy. Following the initial determination that the family is eligible for continued assistance under, the, under DHAP bike based on FEMA requirements, on a quarterly basis, the family must either certify that the family's income has not increased or um, the family's housing cost has not decreased or submit information required by the PHA on behalf of FEMA to redetermine and re-verify the family's continued eligibility for DHAP bike assistance. Um, to determine the DHAP bike monthly rent subsidy, um, until May 1st, 2009, the monthly rent subsidy equaled the lesser of the monthly rent specified in the lease on the one hand, or the greater of the applicable FMR published for the area where the unit is located, or the applicable payment standard for the PHA's housing voucher program. However, after May 1st, 2009, this subsidy was reduced by $50 per month as part of the incremental rent transition. Um, for the families that qualified for a hard, hardship exception, that would have capped the IRT at, um, at an amount determined by the family's income. So in order to determine the hardship exception, um, the family must have demonstrated that the applicable incremental rent transition amount exceeded 30% of the family's monthly income. The 30% threshold only concerns the amount the family is required to pay as the result of the rent transition requirement and does not take into consideration any amount the family pays because the monthly rent exceeds the monthly rent subsidy prior to the application of the IRT requirement. If the PHA determines that a hardship exception is warranted, the PHA will essentially freeze the amount of the subsidy reduction at such point that any further increase would result in the subsidy reduction exceeding 30% of the family's monthly income. For example, if the PHA determined that 30% of the family's monthly income equaled $120, the, sub the subsidy reduction would remain at $100 for that family. Should the family's income subsequently increase, the family um, was required to report the increase in income, and the PHA had to determine whether the family still qualified for a hardship exception, 
and if the subsidy reduction needed to be adjusted in light of the increase in family income. So um, if your PHA has questions about performing these calculations, please go ahead and send them in or email them to dhap ike at hud.gov. And with that, I'll, um, I'll let Nicholas uh, take over. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nicholas Hickman again. Um, today I'm going to speak about two areas as it relates to uh, DHEP Ike records and DIS. Uh, these two areas um, affect ultimately the accuracy of the records in DIS, which should uh, mimic and mirror your hard doc files that Eva has been speaking about for the past several minutes. Um, these areas are also important because it affects also your housing authority's funding um, as HUD utilizes the DIS records to uh, measure its base of funding uh, that is distributed out to your housing authorities for this program. Uh, the first area, just to um, uh, give an announcement as well, you have may have seen over the past several weeks the kickoff of the initial uh, Ike funding uh, program fund reconciliation. The, the, we're taking a step-by-step -step approach here with uh, beginning with the placement fees. Um, the next three areas that will be addressed for the reconciliation, uh, the fund reconciliation will be security deposits, utility deposits, and the HAP um, as recorded in DIS. Uh, just as a reminder, just to be sure to update your DIS records uh, accordingly to the records, your hard doc records at your housing authority. And as always, if you need any assistance, uh, please feel free to contact us here at HUD um, to help coordinate any uh, updates in your DIS records that are necessary. Um, as it relates to the placement fee reconciliation, uh, the policy states that a housing authority is provided a uh, fee up to $1,000 for any ICA family uh, that is placed under its initial lease. Uh, that's the first time the family comes under lease for the program in total. Uh, the other uh, opportunity to earn that $1,000 placement fee is if the family is not placed under a initial lease, but your housing authority assists the family in uh, placing the family in permanent housing, uh, such as a program at your housing authority other than the Ike program. Uh, HUD utilizes DIS data to recognize which families are initial lease and which ones are uh, were placed under permanent housing by your housing authority by looking at uh, the EOP reason on the record. So the EOP reason placed in permanent housing is the signifier for that uh, option. And then as for an initial lease, HUD looks at the initial lease for the, for the family, but is also looking to make sure that the record shows that all three checkboxes are checked, and those three checkboxes are the uh, intake checkbox, the family agrees to case management checkbox, and the uh, landlord assigned the DRSC. Uh, checkbox. In addition to those uh, fields in the record, HUD is also looking at the HAP total column, excuse me, the HAP total field to make sure that there's not a zero value in that field, as well as the lease rent field to make sure. So be sure to uh, update your records to show that those fields do not have zero values in it and the three checkboxes are checked in order for those records to be deemed eligible for review and consideration and funding. Um, for these areas. Uh, the second area to, that I would like to address this morning is on a weekly basis, HUD performs a data validation in the DIS records for Ike families. We look at eight areas initially and then as needed as issues may arise. These areas you may have been contacted about over the past several weeks uh, by staff here at HUD or contractors and it's just to assist you in updating the records correctly according to the program's policy and procedures. The first area that we look at are blank EOP dates. Within DIS, we've noticed that there are some records where an EOP reason has been selected for a family, but no date was entered. There have been uh, a few of those that we've identified, so we send those out to the housing authority to work with the update. Either that means that the date has to be inputted or the EOP reason has to be removed um, in order for that record to be uh, accurate. The second area that we review is the DHAP um, families, DHAP-like families that are not assigned to 
a PHA that's participating in the Ike program. We've identified a couple of these instances where an assignment was made to a housing authority that is not participating, and we're working with that housing authority to identify where the family is and making the correct assignment to a housing, uh, housing authority that is participating in the program. The third area that we review, um, as I mentioned previously, are records where the HAP total is zero. Again, we're looking at first the records that have the three checkboxes checked, and then we start to look at the HAP totals. If we identify any of these uh, records where the HAP is zero and the lease rent is zero, we will shoot these records out to the, your housing authority to update and confirm. The fourth area that we look at are lease effective dates that begin prior to the start of the Ike program. The Ike program began November 1st, 2008, uh, thus lease uh, effective dates should start on or after 11-1-2008. Again, we'll send these records, uh, we have been sending these records out to you to update accordingly. The fifth area that we look at are lease records where a family has multiple leases, but the lease dates overlap in this situation where the lease termination date overlaps with the lease effective date of the next corresponding lease. Um, we will send these records to um, PHAs in two scenarios. We found several records where there are two different PHAs that have this family, one PHA for the first lease and another PHA for the second lease. So we'll correspond with both PHAs for those PHAs to communicate on when the exact termination date of the first lease is and the lease effective date of the second lease is so that they don't overlap. And the second area is when it's the same PHA uh, that has the family for both leases. Uh, just to notify them as well to update those leases accordingly. The seventh area that we look at are families where there are two of the three checkboxes checked. And this is a situation where the families come in for the intake with the housing authority. The checkbox shows that the family signed a DRSC or the landlord signed the DRSC, but the checkbox for the family agreed to case management is not checked. Uh, these records, again, will, are sent out to the Housing Authority for you to update. Either the family is participating in the program or not, and if it's not, then um, we would hope we would, it would be indicated by a EOP status in the family's record. Uh, the last area that we look at on a weekly basis are records where the initial lease um, of the family began after the initial program end date, which was March 31st, 2010. And under the requirements for the extension of the Ike program that goes through October 31st, 2010, it states that there are some exceptions for when a family can lease up for the first time in the program after March 31st, 2010, but it should be documented um, and evidenced by the housing authority in their files. Uh, we want to ensure that those families have full documentation in their hard document files at your housing authority uh, for good reason and just cause. So again, those records will be sent out to your housing authority as well to confirm and update if necessary in DIS. Uh, that's all I have for today. And as always, if you have any questions or issues as it relates to how DIS is, um, should be updated and how the records, uh, how your records view are viewed in uh, the Ike program, please feel free to contact us here at HUD. And I'll turn this back over to Judith. Great, thank you. Um, as both Nick and Eva mentioned, Record cleanup is more important now than ever um, for two reasons. Number one, the possibility of the HCV conversion that's coming up. And uh, secondly, of course, the audits, which are ongoing. Um, I'll speak about the audits for a second. On um, the audits, as you know, we've got internal audits, and we've also got DHS fee, uh, FEMA audits. But now we have a third element, which is the DHS Emergency Management Oversight Office audits. And what they are doing is comparing DHAP Katrina Rita to DHAP Gustav Ike and looking at the programs, efficiencies, inefficiencies, success stories, what was the impact, what was the public served, what do the numbers look like. Um, as I mentioned early on with the Katrina statistics and the Katrina figures, telling the story of DHAP is incredibly important. Um, for any PHA that you know, we've visited or that we've had a chance to talk with, you know that this is something that um, a point that I always like to try and make, the story of, of DHAP, but it's actually really important. Um, these are very expensive programs that we're running, and it's really important to be able to put details and statistics along with the dollars that are, that are spent on these programs. Something really 
interesting that I learn every time we go out into the field and we talk uh, with you all is all of the work that goes into the program. And I can't tell you how, how beneficial it is to get that information from you, to hear what it's like to contact these individuals, what it's like to work with them, because when we are questioned about our program, uh, especially in this third scenario, the Emergency Management Oversight Office, when they ask us about the DHAP program and was it su successful or, or was it not, um, it's, it's really important to be able to counter referrals versus assistance with stories and details that you give us. Um, an example of this is DHAP Ike referred in excess of 51,000 uh, referrals from FEMA. Total assisted, or actually those who accepted our assistance, about 24,000 plus. That means 26,000 or so um, individuals chose not to participate in DHAP Ike. Um, just looking at these numbers on the surface, it really raises a lot of questions. Well, if they didn't participate, then how is the money spent, et cetera, et cetera? Well, it's easy to explain to them. They chose not to participate, therefore we didn't um, give them HAP. However, administrative fees and placement fees um, and all of the other fees, incentive fees, they're, all, they're still up for play or still up for grabs with our PHAs because a lot of work goes into that. Um, in talking to some of you, one of the great points I was able to make is that you send staff out to chase down these referrals. And uh, by chasing down, I mean in some PHAs, staff literally went out and knocked on doors. And staff um, called multiple times. And staff tried every which way to validate that information that was sent to us by FEMA about this individual who could potentially be eligible for our program. The due diligence that you all put into these numbers and to finding out who these individuals were and, and where they were um, is just as important as the assistance that you gave for those individuals who did take our program. That's a much easier story to tell, especially when there's clean data in the system, as, as um, Nick and Eva have mentioned. That's a, it's an easier story to tell. But it's a story of all of the ones who didn't come onto our program, of those who chose not to because they didn't require assistance, were able to go on, et cetera, et cetera. That's the more interesting part because it's important to be able to show to the auditors and to the stakeholders that while they chose not to receive our assistance, you still called them three times a day, several times a week for several weeks in a row. You still sent staff out to knock on their doors. You still created a file folder or a file system or made some notes somewhere. Effort still went into these referrals. They were not just uh, a one-time no thank you or a one-time no answer and then we were done. A lot of work went into that. So when we tell the story of DHAP, the more information you're able to provide us with like this, the better we're able to explain um, our large program and the success of it, or um, in essence, who our target audience ended up being. Something else about the audits, um, when they look at our files, they don't necessarily know what they're looking at. Uh, for PHAs, which we visited, we've had this discussion with, with some, um, and for those who we haven't visited, in the event that you are contacted and you are visited by an auditor, please take the time to walk them through your file. This is really important um, because while we may assume that the auditor knows what they're looking for when they come into the office to review our files, the truth is that they don't. Conceptually, they have an idea. They have an idea of what should be in there because they review our, our operating procedures online or they re review our FAQs or they look at our guidelines. But in actuality, the tangible file, they don't actually know what they're looking for. Should you be visited by an auditor, whether it's a FEMA auditor or a HUD auditor, um, take the time to sit with them for a moment and ask them if they're clear on what they're looking for. This will make all the difference in many cases between a negative rating and a, a pretty decent rating because most of the complaints that we've heard have been that documentation is not in the file. And when we, as the HUD staff have, or DHAP staff, have gone through and reviewed some of these files, we've seen that the documentation is in fact there, it's just a couple of tabs over or maybe not labeled as it should be or uh, maybe looks like something else. So think about your internal processes, think about your files that you have set up and think to yourself, if someone came in without knowing anything about the program and they looked at this file, what would they walk away thinking? Would they know where to look for the RAFTA? Would they know where to look for rent reasonableness? Would they know where to look for the inspection? Does the flow really go in the sense of you can pick up a file and read it and understand it start to finish? Um, Nick made some uh, notes earlier or mentioned something from InfoPath about notes about the individual 
the more comments that we have in there that tell, that tell a story, um, that's really important. And, and we're glad that it takes place in the case management aspect of it because that information really helps us when we're trying to talk to the states and to our stakeholders about the public that we're serving and essentially eventually asking for um, appropriations for these, th these individuals, these families. But it also is important on the rent side when we're looking at what is the employment history of this family? What's the, the composition history of this family? What has this family been through? Because in some files, we'll notice that it's one way at the beginning and completely different towards the end. And a shift happens in a file, and there's nothing in that file anywhere to tell us why, why the shift happened, what the reason was. So these are just a couple of things that are really important um, documentation-wise and also process-wise as these audits continue to happen. And again, as this third element of an audit, comparing DHEP Katrina Rita to DHEP Gustav Eich and looking at FEMA and HUD and was this joint venture successful, um, as it's measured and it's looked at, it's really important to keep that in mind. All of our successes um, with, our, the, with the applicants that we, that we assist don't really mean that much if we can't show them. We know them, but if we can't show them, whether it be through DIS and some numbers, the EOPs returned home or what have you, or through success stories that we've been getting from all of you, if we can't actually show them, um, it's really, really hard to show just the amazing work that our program has been able to do. On the topic of conversion, we are finalizing our plans for the potential DHEP bike conversion. As you all know, we mentioned this last time, we will not have notice or we will not receive word on whether or not uh, we will have a conversion program if the appropriations were approved and were able to proceed until October, sometime October. It could be early October, it could be mid-October. Um, however, it is still something that we've asked that you go forward and begin your eligibility determinations and start processing those families, just start screening them, start working with them for their initial eligibility. So if and when um, the approval comes through, we can seamlessly proceed uh, with no delay on behalf of the family or um, with no complications. Um, I had a question asked last week about placement fees and the eligibility fees. As you know, there are two separate fees that are possible during the conversion. And what would happen for those PHAs who are assisting where other PHAs are not participating? Which one of the two fees are they eligible for? And um, in a scenario like that, we will continue to work as we had with DHAV Katrina, where the individual with the PHA who actually did the eligibility determination is able to earn that fee. And if the placement should happen by another PHA who did not do the eligibility fee, that PHA would earn the placement fee. However, if it's the same PHA that does both, then they will receive both fees. We are, actually I understand we have an email or two email waiting? Great. Okay. As PHAs begin the eligibility determination for HCV conversion as instructed, will the PHA be allowed to rely on document review and family's declaration or certification that the income information submitted by the family is true and complete? rather than other source methods like third-party written verification when determining whether the family is income eligible for voucher assistance and to calculate the family's initial total tenant payment as instructed by Paula O'Blunt for the DAP Katrina conversion? It's a very long question. Um, we try and look at that in parts. Um, document review and the fam uh, family's documentation for conversion. We're following as closely as possible the DHAP Katrina guidelines that we had, um, all the processes we had in place for that. The only area where we will not go directly in line with the DHAP conversion program would be in preferences or the categories which we're assisting. Um, there was no real reason for change in documents that we're accepting, um, everything that we had, and we'll go ahead and reissue that information again to everyone, but everything that we had in place during Katrina will remain the same um, for this potential conversion as well. Um, I'm not sure if that completely answers the question. I'll take this one back and we'll um, email it out to everyone in the FAQs that we send out after the broadcast, but do know that we're not changing up our process very much from the Katrina conversion process. Uh, next question, for HCV conversion, if a DHEP bike family is determined eligible for HCV in September 2010 and has a DHEP 
Have payment of $50 for September 2010. Will the family be eligible for HCV after October since the DHAP HAP payment will be zero for October 2010 and the PHA will not have a definite answer until October when and if the HCV conversion will take place? We're still fleshing out that, that answer and that one relates directly to the preferences and the categories that we'll be assisting. So uh, I hate to give you the answer of I don't have that answer just yet, but we don't have it just yet. It is a scenario that we're trying to work out. Okay, next question. Because it will be not be officially known until early October for conversion will take place, it, will the deadline for conversion fees earned listed in PIH 2010-22 be extended and how soon will be a PHA be funded to carry out leasing a family? Yes, the deadline will be extended and we will be notifying you hopefully by sometime next week on when the fees will be sent to the PHAs, but yes. If a DHAP Ike family is determined eligible for HCV in September 2010, then the head of household becomes deceased in October 2010. Will the remaining eligible family be allowed to have DHAP Ike assistance transferred and be eligible for the HCV conversion? On the surface, this question um, would be a yes. Uh, there are clearly, uh, there are more specifics to the situation, so we would have to discuss it with the individual PHA who submitted this, but we'll include this in our HCV conversion FAQs. And in fact, a lot of the questions that you're um, sending us today that don't actually have an answer as it stands um, will be included in the list that we're compiling for HCV conversion FAQs, including the, the, the one I mentioned earlier about the earning of the fee placement versus eligibility, depending on the PHA's participation. And next question, how do PHAs handle the determination for HCV eligibility when the head of household does not have a social security number? Rather, a family member's is used on their behalf. This is another question for the FAQs. Um, I know we had this in DHAP Katrina, we had this situation, and uh, these are, this is a scenario where the family was referred to us from FEMA, where it was the child who had the citizenship and the adult family member um, who did not, who was applying on their behalf. Um, with Ike being a slightly bit different than Katrina, these are one of the things that we're going to be talking to them on our visit to the National Processing Service Center this Monday. Um, Monday, which is a great segue into my next couple of points, Monday we will be traveling to the FEMA Virginia NIPSI office. Uh, I know a lot of UPHAs uh, are very familiar with the term NIPSI, but for those who are not, it is the National Processing Service Center. And this is pretty much the, the hub of all FEMA processing. At these offices, um, the individuals uh, take registrations, either by phone or they're routed if they, someone applies online. You've got customer service, you've got the helpline, you've got um, the appeals, the mailing that goes out and the mailing that comes in. Checks are issued from there. It's pretty much central nerve system for all FEMA assistance. And uh, Nicholas Hickman and a few others will be traveling out, with, out there with us on Monday. And we will be asking them a couple of questions that pertain directly to HCV conversion, as this is a joint venture between the two of us, and Ike is slightly different than Katrina. But we will also be asking them questions that we've gotten directly from working with you in the field. Um, referral process. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we had uh, in excess of you know, 51,000 referrals to DHAP Ike, uh, which resulted in 24,000 requests for assistance. Um, is there a way to possibly screen these referrals a little bit differently so that we get more of a true need sent to us versus, uh, oh, no, thank you, I got emergency assistance, I'm good now. Um, we're looking at how we can scrub those a little bit better. We're also looking at three different scenarios which seem like the same thing, but they are not. Changing the head of household due to divorces or deaths in the family, widows and widowers. Changing the household composition marriages, births, divorces, etc., and splitting of households, multiple generations, divorces, incarcerations. Now, these three scenarios are usually, by FEMA, handled uh, a lot differently than how we would handle them or how we have been handling them. And because of that, it's something that we need to really hammer out should we have another DHAP engagement. And changing of head of household when someone is widowed or divorced. Um, for any of you who've ever worked with FEMA staff in the field, whether it be at a disaster recovery center, a joint field office, an area field office, or having someone on site with you, you've probably heard that's a domestic issue. We don't assist in those situations. Um, and 
for all intents and purposes, that is traditionally correct. Um, FEMA assistance is emergency assistance, and they look at the here and the now of a situation. How you were at the moment of the disaster is how you will be assisted, whatever your household composition was. Typically, disasters don't go on. Uh, the recovery process doesn't go on five years down the road as this one has. So you don't necessarily see situations like divorces or incarcerations um, as often as we have. And, and for that, we... We need to work on a process with them for expediting these types of requests. I know a lot of you have mailed over time uh, requests to the DHAP bike mailbox or directly to Nick or Eva or myself um, asking to change household composition because you've had uh, a change, whether it be through death or through uh, divorce or what have you. Um, and those are things that we have to work directly with FEMA. Well, we're looking at possibly getting expedited assistance to you in the field. You do not always have time to contact us, and especially in the early days of the disaster, um, I'm sure there are plenty of these cases that didn't get the assistance they should have gotten um, because the staff members who we were dealing with at that time on the FEMA end were probably not well-versed in DHAP or probably not well-versed in the scenarios that we see. So our meeting with them on Monday at the NIPSI, at the Processing Service Center, um, will be to look at these types of things. Um, in talking to some of the PHAs that we've been out there to visit, we've heard uh, good stories about your collaborations with them, but also we've heard some horror stories about um, the limited information you got or incorrect information you got early on. And it's through, again, the great things that we hear from you all and the great information we learn from you that we're able to take these experiences and ask them to assist us in a way um, that really matches with the needs of our program. Splitting of households. This is something that's very um, important because you've got individuals who divorce, okay? However, now instead of one set of needs, you have two sets of needs. You have two households that were once one. Traditionally, FEMA would not assist in that because that's a domestic issue and it's not really uh, related to their short-term emergency housing. But in our situation, we have now taken on this family and there, is two, there are two sets of needs now. How do we assist with them? And how do we make sure that that assistance is, is, is sent to us directly and recognized and we are able to provide this assistance to the individuals? So we're going Monday armed with your questions to the Ike mailbox, armed with our FAQs and a couple of other bullets that I've put together, and we're going to ask them these things. So if you can think of anything um, today or over the weekend or what have you, anything other than some of the points I've covered, um, please let us know. Two other points would be, Renting from family. While this may work for FEMA for emergency purposes, uh, it is not, as you know, something that uh, we're able to work with as easily as they are. In the event of renting from family, I have cousins or uh, my children or what have you that are living with me at the time of a disaster, and uh, they are now eligible for rental assistance. Therefore, I provide a handwritten receipt that they're living with me, and um, they're able to request rental assistance that I then pocket. Uh, I know a lot of you have seen that situation. I know recently uh, Eva and Nick came back from the field and mentioned the situation as well. And um, while, it, again, in times of emergency assistance or emergency situations when there's limited housing or no housing available, it's acceptable on, under FEMA's guidance and under FEMA's program. But as HUD and um, administrators of HUD programs, we are not able to acknowledge that as an appropriate landlord-tenant situation. So um, we're working with FEMA to maybe preface to their population that they assist that when the DHAP Ike referral or DHAP referral uh, occurs, that this is something they must work with us on. Because while it would have been acceptable under the FEMA program, it's not necessarily the case under the HUD program and going forward working with us. Uh, one last scenario is field staff. Something that we often heard from the PHAs when working with you is that you had individuals walk directly up to your office and tell you, FEMA says I'm eligible. I've got this piece of paper. I've got this form here um, that says I'm eligible. However, you would go into DIS to look for them, and you would not find them. Um, this is a problem. Uh, we know this, we hear it from you, we understand it completely to be a huge problem to you and to your operations um, because often in the field, at the recovery center, or at the field office, or at the area field office, you know FEMA representatives can take a person who was not referred to us in the initial data dumps because they may not have been eligible for assistance, and they can take that individual and make them eligible in the field. 
Now, what happens here and how this affects us, and um, I, don't, I didn't bring an outline, so I'll just use my hands to show you. Um, you've got the field referral here. It doesn't ever make its way back up to FEMA headquarters, who sends it to DIS to send it to us. The information stays here. So they walk directly to the PHA and they say, hey, FEMA says I'm eligible, can you assist me? And you look in DIS and no information ever came down, so it's not there. We will definitely draw a much better diagram than I'm able to show you with my hands, but to explain to FEMA why it's great that they're able to process individuals in the field, but if this information from them never makes it to their NIPSI, who sends it to our offices, who then puts it in DIS to send it to you, um, it causes more problems for us than they even know. And it also loses time for that family that they could be receiving assistance and complicates things for our PHAs. So that's one final scenario. If you can think of any more throughout the course of the day or you know, if you want to shoot me an email over the weekend, um, things like this that maybe you'd like us to look into or assist you with, please do. Because every bit that we learn from you helps us try and mold this into a program that um, really suits the, the, the needs of the field and um, really suits the environment that we work in, which is definitely different than the environment that the FEMA program is administered in. And with that, I have only one last thing to say, and that is that our Nicholas Bilka will be leaving us today. It's his final day, it's his final broadcast, and it's his final day with us here in DHAP. And I just wanted to take a second and thank him. Thank you very much for all of the assistance that you've given us and all the assistance that you've been able to give to the PHAs. Um, you will be missed, and you've just done an awesome job. Thank you very much. And um, any email that you have or any contact that, um, questions that you have for Nicholas Bilka, please refer them to joy, J-O-Y, dot R, dot Montgomery, M-O-N-T, G-O-M-E-R-Y, dot, at, uh, at HUD, dot gov, I'm sorry. Um, so if, I will also have that in an email to send out to all of you. But again, thank you, Nick, and thank you for everything you've done. You've been awesome. Thanks. And with that, um, that's our show for today. Thank you very much.